if this works. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see if this actually works. I'm not getting a notification as yet, but I'll wait and see here if there's if, anything. If, if if we do go live, I'm gonna have to make it fairly brief. I have to cut it around nine. Sure. So so if we get to uh get to the meat of the matter, that would be cool. If it doesn't, we can always just reschedule it. It's live, fellas. We are actually live now, so that's great. I don't know what happened. We had some major glitch with um, Cloudware tonight, and I'm really sorry to these guys. We're going to have to have them back on again. So we'll get to the meat of the interview here. And uh, if uh, if uh, you have to leave at any point in time, anybody's got to leave at any point in time, just go ahead and do that. I'm just going to share this out a few places because it's, yeah. it's the people that wanted to actually hear this tonight. Get back here, mister. Oops. <laughs> Jesus, wheezes. Um, what a night. Um, anyways, we've got uh, Steve Nagus here Steve Nagus <laughs> with us tonight. And we've got Kelly Kierlich with us tonight. And uh, we're going to be talking uh, Negus music. Um we talked about briefly, and just you can maybe just give us the real quick Coles notes on that, Steve. Um, Larry's Hideaway. Just the Coles notes on it. Okay, Larry's Hideaway. 1974. I was playing there with Grant Fullerton in a band called Fullerton Dam. And... Uh, I mean, Larry's Hideaway was just, it was kind of a scuzzy bar. I mean, it was nothing special, but everybody played there back then. It had character, you know, the stench of the carpets from the you know, centuries old beer. And But I was playing there and, and uh, the guys from Flood came in. And uh, so I'm having a beer with, with uh, Brian Pilling, who's no longer with us. And they offered me the gig. They said, he was basically, we're having a beer. And he says, yeah, we're looking for a new drummer. I said, oh, yeah, who you got in mind? He says, well, he's sitting right here. And I, I hadn't even thought about it. I was not on my radar. But they, they, they offered me the gig. And uh, after a little bit of deliberation, I decided to join Flood. And that uh, Jimmy Crichton and Peter Roshan were in the band. And... Uh, both of those guys later were part of the the saga rhythm section, right? And and so for you, I mean, there's life after after a saga. You you're making uh, new music on the go still. Uh, you and Kelly have a project out right now. Yes, Econ well, we're we're just uh, we've just finished Economy of Motion, which is our, our new album. That's an interesting uh, title for an album. Where does that come from? Well, it actually came from a conversation that Kelly and I had right here in this room. I'm, we're, I'm in my uh, studio downstairs at home. Uh, we, we were just talking about how you get better. Because when I, uh, when I decided to come off the road, when, when we kind of, realized that the the first rendition of, of the Negus band was not quite working and we would change stuff. Uh, Kelly and I were, were working here in the studio, working on new ideas. <clears throat> and uh, it, at, at the same time, I was spending a lot of time just playing woodshedding, if you like. Uh, I wanted to, to do something different with this album, which I think we've done. And I wanted to explore a bunch of new grooves and I wanted to try and throw away the rule book, which uh, what I realized is you, you can't really do that. You just end up with a, a bigger book. <laughs> so uh, economy of motion is, is really, that's the mechanics of playing. And it doesn't matter whether you're a musician or an athlete or uh, businesses are always looking at economy of motion for assembly line, it's how you do something with maximum effort, maximum results with minimum effort. Right. And, and that's, I mean, the thing about when you watch, when I watch Kelly play, it's completely effortless. And he's playing, you know, he can be playing all this really cool stuff. <laughs> guitar, 
And he's not, he doesn't break a sweat that boy. I, I mean, there's something wrong with him, you know, <laughs> that, that is, you know, and th there's a uniqueness to that, that ability. And, and the uniqueness to that ability is the way that Kelly's brain is wired. Well, I, I just think if you do your due diligence and, uh, the, the, obviously, Kelly lives, eats, breathes guitar. I mean, when we were doing our first gig as Negus, uh, Kelly would wake up with his coffee, and I do this too. He would wake up with his coffee and his guitar in his lap, and he's playing. His eyes aren't even open yet. <laughs> you know? So. Don't forget the metronome, right? Oh, yeah, with the metronome going on. Coffee and the metronome. That's what it was. Yeah. So, that's how you get to that point. And, uh, I mean, athletes spend, uh, this, you know, when you look at the hundred meter guys, they're watching videos to watch every movement of their body so that they can streamline their, their energy and efforts to get the maximum results. Well, as musicians, you don't quite do that, but you learn how to economize your motion to get maximum power and energy and speed by economizing your movement, right? Sean, so they, you're a working musician. What do you think of that? I I agree because, um, you know, the distance between point A and point B is a straight line, right? And unfortunately, a lot of people kind of want to go all around the, 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 the watchtower. And I mean, everybody has their ability. Kelly's got a skill set. Steve has a skill set. I have a skill set. You have a skill set. Everybody's skill set's different, but I think if you can take what they're talking about, this economy of motion, put it into your package of what you do, it will help you tighten up and, and, and you know, improve and, 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 and move things along. Um, and I just want to say, um, when, when they were on my, my show, um, Steve sent me the, the album, and uh, I got it right away. I mean, you know, the first thing I said to Kelly, uh, you know, he and I texted afterwards, and I was like, holy smokes. Did Steve practice a lot? And the answer was yes, because, I mean, Steve was always a great drummer, but, wow, I mean, his playing was just so different than, than I had remembered. Um, so that theory of economy of motion, I got it right away, and, you know, I, I, I totally agree. I, there's a lot of really cool calculated notes in there that, that the guitar and the drums play together, which I thought was really unique in a lot of the tracks. Um. And and I put that, that mishmash together, like, and I, I got to play it, at the end of the show tonight because we didn't get it at the beginning. It went all hoppity, hippity, hoppity. And, right. uh, and I, I want to play it for people so they can get a taste of it, but there's a lot of technical stuff in there, guys. There is. I mean, I spent a lot of time. Uh, I wanted this album to be different when we decided <clears throat> to do an instrumental album, which we didn't do right off the bat. Al was right. actually going to work with us on this album. Right. Uh, Al, Al Langlade, who, who sang on the last Negus album. Um, we just kind of fell into it. The, the stuff that Kelly and I were writing really wasn't all that suitable for vocals. So we well, we just, I decided at one point that, that uh, why don't we do an instrumental album? And I wanted to really push the envelope. I, so yeah. for me, at the time I was listening to what I like to call world music. Right. So I was listening to African rhythms and I was listening to a lot of Latin stuff, the right. Af Afro-Cuban stuff. And I really wanted to just uh, immerse myself in rhythm that wasn't specifically prog rock or wasn't specifically anything. It's funny there because there's one lick in one of those songs. And I think I captured it in the, in the two minute mashup and it's got a hint a hint of yes in it. Yeah, I I think were you influenced by yes? Well, I yeah, I would say so, but uh, I don't think it was <laughs> done uh, Kelly. consciously. I think it maybe subconsciously. Uh, another big one for me was Super Tramp. Okay, you know, actually, it's interesting because I, I haven't posted this, but I always wanted to. Uh, everybody knows Super Tramp. Right. I mean, yeah. it's a household name. Who's the drummer? Ah, good point. <laughs> good point. Can you you guys can't tell me, can you? Nope. Nope. Not offhand. No. It's Bob Siebenberg. 
most underrated drummers on the planet, right? Uh, and yet, Super Tramp. Everybody in the everybody in the world knows Super Tramp, but they can't tell you who the drummer is. I asked my wife the same thing. Who's the drummer for Super Tramp? That guy's amazing, right? <laughs> so, anyway, it's it's off topic, but uh, we I wanted to explore and and have been exploring, uh, right? latino approach there's some there's some cool um like i hear some like uh are, are the, am i hearing conga drums in some of the tracks yeah absolutely yeah. i got congas here now and yeah. i'm learning, learning how to play those yeah I, 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 I can hear them shining through in in the tracks and they they complement a lot of the different notes being played i i i really like that aspect of the rhythm well you know what's interesting in in this is a good story in 1978, uh, we just Saga had just finished the first album. Uh, Peter Roshan decided to leave, and we got this guy Greg Chad, who was not very well liked by most of the guys in the band, and we eventually fired him. Um, he actually said to me, he was one of these guys who blamed everybody else for his own shortcomings. And he, he turned to me and he said, you're timing suspect. And I went, what? He says, you're timing suspect. And I I didn't know quite what to say, but I said, well, you, I'll show you how I, my timing's not suspect. The second album, I'm going to do it to a click track just to show you that it's not. And if you listen to the first album, I, I think you'd be hard pressed to find too many spots where he, the tempo is moving up or down at all like how long is like rock solid at the 16th in the pocket you know right right so anyway i just thought he was a you know an idiot <laughs> <laughs> but what it did do is is uh, uh, the first time i attempted it we actually put a, a pickup on a on a big uh tiktok you know one of these big metronomes with the big arm and you adjust the pe the lead weight on it and it's right. like I had that. I had to have that so loud in my headphones that my my ears were just blowing up. So what I realized is I like the idea of working with a click, and I have been ever since. But what I did is I got a little. Uh, at the time they had this little box. It was called a Korg Super Percussion. Right. And it was really cheesy. It was probably the size of this here. It was about this big. And it had, uh, I think there were probably eight bit uh, percussion samples, but it had all the Latin stuff. So I had cowbell and maracas and clave and all that stuff. Right. So I put together a pattern. And what I realized with click tracks is if it's straight quarter notes, you only hear it when you're off of it. Yep. So right. uh, the typical thing that I would do is put the tambourine on the ups so the one and two and three and that I right. can hear in the headphones and it doesn't have to be very loud because it's in the holes. Right. And then I would put a typical sort of conga pattern and da da ba da da ba da da ba da. And that's what I played to from that point on. All of the Saga albums were done with that. And so was this one. <clears throat> so the Latino thing for me has actually been there way back to 78. And so the but the Latino thing from what I'm understanding has to be done with such precision. That's why you're using a click. Uh, well, I, I think our, our music in in general, uh, it, you have to have that that kind of precision, right? Uh, regardless, mm -hmm. I just think what I did is is I I I don't just copy a Latino groove and say, okay, we're going to write this Latino piece, right? What I have to do then is I have to interpret that and and incorporate that in who I am as a player. Right. So I have to, we call it I call it negasizing. Right. <laughs> right. So I have, I have to negasize that groove. So for example, uh, the track that's called Latino Seven on the new album, I went okay. Well, how can I make this different? So I I dropped an eighth note and I took it into seven A. And then, then I found the pocket. Then it took me a while to actually be able to play comfortably in, in that particular 7-8 groove. Right, and right. I just played it 
uh, four bar phrase my way through it hours and hours on end until I had all the stuff that I felt that I needed to go forward with, with working with creating the tune. And then uh, I find that once I, I do that, then eventually I start to hear where the music goes. So, so in terms of writing the, the actual music itself and figuring out the arrangements and stuff like that, Kelly, which, what was your part in all that? In a lot of cases, I would show up to Steve's place after, like in the initial stages of beginning writing, I was teaching uh, at a music store instead of here at, at home like I do now. <clears throat> so I would be done at about nine. We'd end up at Steve's place at around 10. And by the time I got there, he had already worked out uh, the basics of, a, a, let's call it a new song, something I've never heard. And it would be a basic rhythm track of, of drums, uh, synth bass, maybe some additional percussion, maybe some keys, depending on how far along he was um, with the track at the time. And um, in a lot of cases, uh, he, would, he, would, he might have a synth part that he thought would be like, we'll call it the theme. Or, or the chorus right. or the hook, I guess. Right. And the idea was that I would take that role. It wouldn't necessarily be the keys. It would be he wanted the guitar to play that part. So I would learn it and, and record it, uh, okay. usually on the spot. So uh, there were a few times where he knew specifically where he wanted me and what he wanted me to play. But then there were parts where he would be looking at me going, okay, uh, here's some groovy... like." his description of what he wanted became more vague. And so that's, that was my cue to go, okay, well, what do I hear here? Right. So from the, from the time you picked that piece up and started your contribution to the music, um, what are you thinking now? You've got some idea about what you're going to do. How many, by the time you get this down, how many takes does it take you to get it? Well, by the time I got to that point, I was tired and hungry from teaching <laughs> 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 so the, well in most cases it would be because there's so much complexity going on that in a lot of the cases that i the part that i would hear me playing would be more supportive okay it, so it might be a more of a repetitive rhythm or or maybe a compliment like a counterpointish melody or ostinato that that goes underneath or over top depending on its role uh, it really depended on the part. There's, you know, without, you know, pointing out specific songs, it really came down to just listening and going, what should be here as opposed to what do I want to do here? And I think a lot of players, they might do that. They might think, well, what do I want to do here as opposed to what should be here? And okay. that's what I tried my best <laughs> to do during those moments. All right. And, and so um, you guys, uh, is there how much collaboration is there in that sense? There's actually a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, I what I would do is I would just I would set up uh, pockets for where an instrument like the guitar would sit. But uh, I I I don't like to stifle my players, and I don't I don't like to just spoon feed them and say okay this you have to play this. A lot of it. Uh, even the attitude that we went into it with um, was experimental. So we put down the initial idea, which was probably coming from me. And, and then uh, Kelly would embellish that and, and develop it. And I think where, where Kelly had the, the real uh, chance to shine, so to speak, is I would say, here's 32 bars. Play. And I wouldn't tell him what to play. No, and, and no, you put keys in there too, right? Yeah, so there would be a groove there. But what I'm doing is th this is your chance to express, <clears throat> so do it, right? But And even having said that, when we did that, uh, it was never like the, the deer in the headlights uh, syndrome where the, the red lights are on, we're recording. We were recording all the time uh, with the idea that nothing was sacred. It could either stay or not stay, but we'll put it down, see how it feels, and yeah. then live with it. Uh, interestingly enough, like, the, for example, the, the solo on the Economy of Motion track was uh, one take. Right. And it, 
that was a, an occasion where I just said, Kelly, you got 64 bars, play solo. Right. The groove's there. You, know, you got the keyboards, the bass, the drums. It's all there. Play solo. And that's the actual solo that's on the album. Yeah, the cool that's thing the thing about the. The cool thing about these collaborations, though, is you guys can, like, you're you're not always with each other. So you guys can, you go about your life. And I was going to say, Kelly, before I interrupted you, uh, say what you were going to say, because that, I've got another question for you, Kelly. Sure, yeah. I was just going to say that uh, the initial process, actually, let's just preface it by saying the majority of what ends up on the album guitar-wise was not meant to be there initially it was just treated as a demo like right down to what we used to record the guitar i would never say i was going to record an album with this unit okay we'll divulge what the unit is in a minute but the point is that the idea is every time that steve and i would get together in our writing process a lot of it ended up staying we ended up listening to it later steve does a mix and he's like come on over and check this out i'm like I'm supposed to come over with my my half stack and we're going to mic it up or we're going to <laughs> do all this shit. And he's like, if you want to, but I don't think we need to. And I'm like, you might be right. There really wasn't much redoing of anything. It ended up being the demo stuff that stayed. It, it's funny, you know, sometimes, you know, it, it almost goes back to that whole idea. It takes you 10 years to write your first album. So it's like, yeah. wow, you know, like there's that uh, that that there but how did you do that i mean you, you're talking you're teaching all day right well you just look well, i mean the teaching thing i love anyway but it's that it's that session that you get to hang out and and create you just look forward to so Plus, it's a different it's a different energy then totally different energy even if you don't have any left right, <laughs> right. no but <laughs> but other than that i mean think of it that way too i'd been on a typical day that steve and i would get together at that time i would have been teaching for six hours so i'm pretty warmed up so wow. by the time it takes to get creative like whatever ideas come in to my head there's really not a lot of prep needed my hands are ready to go so it would be a matter of whatever i can formulate in my head i might have to work it through a couple times and then we hit right. the go the you know we hit the go button and and it's it, down it, here's a funny thing like we you talk about vast vastness and difference in terms of approach to recording and whatnot. The guy, the, the three guys that I work with, we record everything live off the floor. Yep. Right. No dubs, no overdubs. So every time we, we play it, we're trying to find that best version of that song. Right. Right. So it's funny because we record every session that we do. We record 90 minutes of session every time here in the studio and we've got the mix down so good. I don't even have to to remix it. It's everything. You can hear all the instrumentation, everything perfectly, right? So the guys are listening to it back. And then we we went back to January of this year. And they're like, that takes better than what we're doing now. Yeah, weird, eh? Uh, it, was, it, was, it was really weird. Yeah, well, we, we really couldn't work that way. Because uh, it's just, just Kelly, myself, and Mike. Right. And uh, I ended up doing most of the keyboard work on the album. Right. And uh, so I need to be both sides of the glass at different at the same time, basically. Right. Even when I record my drums, I'm the engineer at the same time. So I have 20 mics on my kit and it's all set up, ready to go. But I am indeed the engineer and the musician at the same time. So. Then what I do is I, I come into here. This is obviously my control room. Yep. And I work my ideas out. So I would program what I've been playing. Then I would start to build the, the music around my, because the, the whole thing, almost the whole thing is rhythm driven. So we're right. starting with the rhythm. And and so I would program the same rhythm I'm playing out right. there, drum kit. I come in here and program that. And then start to build the tracks around that. Right. Okay. Cool. So uh, that uh, we, we never did live off the floor because basically we can't do live off the floor. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're yeah. you're not in a position to be able to do it, and that's why this 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 type of collaborative effort works really really well. Yeah. Um, I'm still working on playing drums and keyboards at the same time. Right. 
I, I haven't perfected it yet. So soon right. come. <laughs> well, it, it, it's interesting because I mean, you never know. There might be other uh, other uh, music creators out there who um, are interested in collaborating with you. Would you ever consider that? Hell no. <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course. Because you've got you've got some really really great ideas um, rhythmically that's influenced your playing. And here's another cool thing about you is that you're no stranger to playing with uh, with keyboardists. No, I've been in obviously uh, 26 years. I was in Saga. I mean, with Saga was a keyboard band, you know. And, and you and you and you played with a guy who went on to be very very famous. Um. A keyboard player who, who by the name of Paul. Paul Schaefer. Oh, Paul Schaefer. Yeah, but th th back then, I mean, that was the young street scene. That was just, uh, uh, every, we were all, all working musicians, and we just played the bars up and down Young Street when we all first started. Yeah, but to you got, you went to the, you, I mean, you played with the guy who ended up playing for Letterman. Yeah, but, uh, you know, I mean, we were passing ships in the night, so to speak. You know, he had a house gig and I'd go sit in. But I'd sit in with whoever was playing there. It didn't matter to me. I just wanted right. to play. So he just happened to be there. There were some other great players there, too. I don't know. That's what I'm saying. You probably met a lot of different guys over the years that went on to do a lot of different things. Some that maybe never even went on to do what you did. Well, yeah, I mean, in... in when I first moved to Toronto, I was uh, working for the Bank of Montreal. I was a, a banker, and I was playing in a country band at night. So I had a I had a house gig playing in this country band. So it was all music. It really didn't matter, you know. Uh, and I, uh, the point I wanted to make is, like my I used to play pool at Young and Bloor. There was a pool hall <laughs> right by the subway, and the guy I used to play pool with was Leon Redbone. Oh, wow, Leon Redbone. Do you know who he is? Probably uh, I know, not. I know the name. He went. He moved to New York and became extremely famous. And uh, uh, he, he did like 20s and 30s. He had one of these uh, really deep voices. Right. He sang all those, those 20, 30s uh, skiffle <laughs> tunes. Awesome, awesome, totally awesome. He was... Totally off the wall guy. It never gave you a straight answer to anything, but that was my. <laughs> Look him up. Oh man! Look oh him man! Up. Oh wow! So um, so this whole album um, it's all instrumental, and how does this vary from previous works? Well, uh, it's, it's all instrumental. <laughs> 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 well, that's not true. I sang on it. Oh, true. No, technically, that is absolutely true. So it's not all instrumental. Actually, uh, my wife, Nicole, and I, and Al Langlade, who sang on the first one, uh, Negus album, we did. We recorded 100 tracks of vocals on the opening track, the orchestral intro, as it, as it was titled, as we were working, working title. Uh, we did 100 tracks of vocals to create a choir on that. Right. So I sat, sat in here and I did 30 tracks of vocals myself. Then Al came and doubled everything I did. And then we had to do 40 of Nicole because we had two guys, 60 tracks of uh, Al and I, and, and we had to do 40 of her just to kind of try and balance it up a bit. So, so Kelly, at what, at, we just lost Sean for a second there. There we go. Um, Kelly. So at what point do you come into this whole thing, this whole mix called Negus? Okay, well that was that 2007, I think something like that. I was at a local jam night uh, here in Hamilton, and uh, Steve and I had some mutual friends. Actually, the Negus bass player at the time, Ian, um, was one of the guys that was sort of running the jam night. Like he was involved in the house band, and um, so I had gotten up to play something, and. Uh, I think Ian came to me after he goes, I got someone you uh, you should meet. I go, oh, okay. Here in this bar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I go, so get off stage and we walk up to the bar and 
he's like, here, this is uh, Steve Negus. Do you, do you know, do you know Steve? I'm like, I, well, I know of him. I, you know, uh, I hadn't met him before. I don't think we had met prior to that. Had we? No, we hadn't. Okay. So Steve kind of snuck in and I don't know if he was there on purpose or just. I was. Were you? Yeah. See, I yeah. didn't know that. So I was there on purpose. Yeah. Steve, Steve snuck in to go and, and check out what was going on. And uh, so we just started talking and he mentioned that he needed a guitar player due to the unfortunate passing of his guitar player at the time, Mark. Yeah. And so that first album was all Mark and uh, he, he passed away shortly after he completed his parts. Correct. Two weeks after he finished the album, he fell asleep behind the wheel in his bed and went into oncoming traffic and head on collision. Oh my yeah. goodness. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. Wow. So at that point, they hadn't played any gigs, obviously. Um, so Steve was looking to put together a live band. And the band was intact, except for the guitar player. So um, I happened to show up to jam night at the right time, apparently. Huh. Yeah, but, all... well, I went down there specifically to check out Kelly because he had told me good stuff about him. So, well, yeah, he. I felt he was the guy. Yeah, so you're looking for somebody that you thought would really really help with the finished product absolutely yeah um because i mean there's some really cool guitar parts and the tracks that shine and um there's some and, and, i mean i don't i don't know what you call those notes kelly because i'm not that technical about lead guitar playing but there's a they're whole bunch of notes what's that <laughs> they're weedly weedlies well there's a bunch of notes that he <laughs> plays on top of your drums i think they did they did like staccato maybe probably staccato yeah. very, very i was gonna say staccato but that, yeah. that i wasn't i wanted to make sure it was right yeah yeah really very really. very 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 cool and it's and it's like and there's that one part it's like uh that part of yes um um i can't i'm trying to think of the track um that it but there's a familiarity because i used to listen to yes years ago um that was my first introduction into prog rock yeah well, those those staccato parts on my end probably were from aldi miola uh, aldi miola okay. i'm thinking that's the aldi miola <laughs> influence uh, from my end i mean listening to it from a distance you could look at it and go oh i hear the yes influence in there because they certainly did a lot of that as well right um yeah but yeah you yes. know, it's, re it's really funny. A buddy of mine, they used to love listening to Al Di Miola. So yeah, much, too. so much so that everybody in his family has the, la the last name Ola, right? <laughs> so it's like Jimmy Ola, Johnny Ola, Susie Ola, Lori Ola. And, and I'm not, I'm his brother from another mother. So he says, well, you can be Ken Ola. Oh, like canola oil. Canola oil. <laughs> cool. Oh, man. I'm anyway, sorry, Ken. But, you're never going to live that one down. Uh, but they loved El Demiola so much that right, we Sean used to Ola? listen to it, listen to him a lot, eh? Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, I, I was listening to uh, Lenny White, was high on my list, and Return to Forever, Chick Corea. You know, I, I definitely listened to a lot of that stuff. Yeah. Right so a lot of influences in, 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 in your um, your spheres, because, I mean, Steve's influence came early. Kelly, yours, your influences obviously came later because there's an age differential between the two of you. Um, so what influenced you in terms of your sound? Oh, well, there's so many. I mean, it really comes down to, if I look at it now to answer that question, honestly, you'd, we'd have to pinpoint what style. Because if it's rock, I have a set of players. If it's... Um, metal i have a set of players if it's progressive stuff there's a few players and then i look back and all like one of the things that i did especially um in the earlier days is getting into buying guitar magazines i would research inadvertently my favorite players and find out who they were influenced by and then go and check them out okay so we you're licks and negus right okay. so let's let's just Where's, say yeah a, mo from? Right, a modern example would say uh, Steve Morris or a John Petrucci, right? So Dream Theater, Dixie Dregs, uh, maybe a bit of Vinnie Moore in there. But because of 
of how much I like those guys, I would check out who they were influenced by. Mm. So then I go back and I can say, oh, well, there's John McLaughlin. Oh, there's, uh, you know, whoever. They're Charlie all in Christ good company. Charlie Christian. <laughs> right. Yeah. And then you get into different styles. So if you allow the web to be formed, like you, you can take a, a central player that you're fascinated with and find out who they were into. All of a sudden, you, you're not just a fan of that guy. You're a fan of his sphere of influence. Right. And then down it goes, right? You check out those guys, find out who they liked, and you see where it all comes from. So right. that's so where why does your, it's real. Where, where does your creative juice come from then when, when you're thinking about Lex for Negus? I don't. It comes from melody. It really comes from melody. It's not mm -hmm. any it's not specifically designed after anybody's playing or even stylistically it it's uh there's a rhythmic theme which suggests a melodic theme mm. then it, it's obviously that the guitar is the best instrument to pre to present the melodic theme and develop that so it it's really got nothing to do of okay that this is uh based on yes or this is based on Jim right. Giant. None of the stuff was done like that. It, it's all thematic. So we would uh, establish a theme and a rhythm, and then we would take it places. But it, in, and uh, one of the, the key things that we wanted to do with this album, because it is instrumental, uh, melody was tantamount. It was so important that every song has to have a melody that you can remember on first listening. So then, so the, you know, the, the thought process there, when you're thinking about that is, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of feel in that. Yeah. And, and uh, one of the things I like to do too is, is I call them little uh, musical jigsaw puzzles. Right. Which is probably comes a little bit from say general giant, you know, where, where they, they have counterpoint, stuff going on so there's a guitar is playing one rhythm the, the keyboards are playing another the drums are playing another right. rhythm and it's like a conversation right. so if, if you were thinking about how you guys go about the writing process for this particular album uh, economy in motion uh as you as you're approaching the writing and thinking about writing the music right there's a lot of feel that goes in that right Yes, uh, and a lot of, I mean, we were exploring, and this is what took a lot of time for me in particular, uh, different time signatures. And like, for example, uh, the chase of the thrill actually changes time signatures at least 10 times during that piece of music. Uh, to, the key is actually not just to change signatures, right. but have it flow as a piece of music. Yeah, I think one of the things that got me also following uh, uh, Kelly um, was that that whole thing, like watching him in play in his approach to playing music um, and guitar playing in particular. Just the way, I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of gift there, buddy. I'm sorry, there's a lot of gift. There's yeah. a, also a, a lot of work involved in what you do. And a lot of discipline in what you do, and yeah, yeah, I taught him every day. <laughs> and, and, and and I, I don't think people appreciate that enough because there's a great deal of work that goes into becoming the caliber of player that you are. Because if you're sought after, you know, by people like Steve, that tells you something about your caliber of playing. Well, the funny thing is, I don't want people to think about that. Right. You know what I mean? Like as an audience member or a listener, I don't want you to be burdened by thinking, oh my God, that guy put so many hours in. Let's give him a few bonus bucks. I don't want, <laughs> I just want you to enjoy it. I don't, I, I want you to hear the end result. I don't want you to see behind the curtain. Not that I'm like trying to hide it, but I don't want to make people feel burdened. Like, oh my God, you can tell he spent 50 hours so on that lick. You that's know what the, I mean? That's yeah, the humility, know. though. That I mean, that you, you know, you you create with humility, right? I mean, is that that human part of you that says, "Look, at, I don't think consider myself anything special above anybody else. I have, I'm a contributor. I have something, a gift I want to give back, and this is a way of giving that gift back." Yeah, no, it's fair to say for sure. Yeah, because I it's mean, like a, if you watch a great 
anybody, a great comedian or a great oh. magician, you don't, you, do you really want to know their secrets? Do you really want to know how they do it? Because if you did, you wouldn't find it all that great. Like, in other words, if I let someone sit in my practice room and watch me practice, right. they're going to be like, well, psh, psh, all right, great. That's all that is. They're not going to be so you know, entertained if they see it live or hear it on the record. They're going to know what's behind the curtain. I think you're a guy that's that's been able to capture that whole, um, you know, that the whole that whole learning thing about your craft. You know, some people don't do it that well. You seem to have an ability in terms of just the way you're wired. Right. To think in that way. Um, to be able to be that technical about your ability when you play and not everybody has that ability. There's a way that you've been able to condition yourself to, to even get better at it. Cause when you play, you look, it looks effortless, man. I've heard yeah, that. Yeah. He doesn't break a sweat. <laughs> no. And, and, and yet at the same point in time, it's like you're, you seem to be somewhere like I can, you, I can see you re really into what you're doing so deeply so that you've got this amazing muscle memory in your fingers it's a i don't think it's any different than any any other skill that's developed i mean really i i can say that all of my favorite players fall in the exact same category right. and i probably can say with 100 percent certainty that a, a lot of those traits were passed down th from them hearing the interviews with them and hearing how they thought about stuff that made me go, huh, oh, yeah, right. that is actually a really good perspective. Right. Um, is, do, you, do you guys, you guys both come from musical families? No. No. Oh, that's interesting in itself. I, I thought I was weird, but he's apparently just as weird as me. I am. Wow. <laughs> well, I mean, there you go. Maybe that's why you guys gel when it comes to creating, right? Music, right? Well, I, I, we, we have a, we just have a way of working together that, that, mm. Yeah, it, it's very non-egotistical, as you mentioned. Kelly's not egotistical, and neither am I. It's, it's all about just creating really interesting music that, that pleases us. Right. And I really think that was one of the major keys for us with this album, is, is we realized that at this point, we don't have to please anybody but ourselves. Right. But having said that, we are our own worst critics. Sure. So. What that does is it, it 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 allows you to open the the door for uh, new ideas and new ways of thinking, uh, but still being able to control the the result. Yeah, I, I mean that's I think that's probably one of the reasons why you know um, I took the approach that I did a, a while back. For a long time, I was doing a lot of public publishing of music for artists, right? So I publish, I, I would publish things widely, but I wasn't posting, I wasn't publishing exclusively on my website. I was completely underutilizing that resource. And, and then I, you know, I found more like-minded people out there that were interested in putting their music up on a platform that wasn't so public, you know, like Spotify and iTunes and all that. They just wanted it up on my website because they're hoping that people that looking for independent music will find their music more readily on my website than they will in the minutia out there. Right. And, and I've had people drop me emails saying, Hey, I, I stopped by your website, um, checked out some of the artists on your website, man, that's really, really cool. What you got going on over there. Right. Mm -hmm. So people are starting to see, stuff like that that's more exclusive is a place to find these gem these hidden gems especially when you don't really care about always gaining you know popularity or, or anything like that it's about why you're doing the music in the first place and if people like it that's great too well i think one of the things steve when he said that we're just you know please ourselves first it's because we know that if we're happy there's going to be other people who dig it Right. Yeah. It's, it's like we're not going out of our way to go there, but I think we can say we, we have good taste. We know what we like. <laughs> we know it's good. And we're not alone. There are other people out there who are going to be like, yeah, you're That's right. It. I you like know, I, who do you like? You know, yeah. I mean, 
<laughs> so when I so when I went through and put the mashup together, I and Sean, you can interrupt anytime you want, buddy. So I'm not here. It's a Sean Mannequin doll. <laughs> Sean Seanakin. <laughs> Sean Sean well, no, I here's here's what I in listening to the conversation though. Um two things. I mean, one, your point about playing for yourself, because I'm a big believer that you do that, right? And if people like it, great. And if they don't, that's fine too, because I think you got to please yourself before you please anybody. Um, You know, this whole thing about working your tail off so that you go out so that people are, you know, impressed. I mean, I know a couple of people who post stuff on YouTube and they'll get 50 great compliments, but they'll focus on the one negative one. And that's just, you know, you're doing it for the wrong reasons. The second point that I'll say is, and I've got to know Kelly a little bit over the last few months. Um, what he does is effortless. And I, the one thing I had the opportunity to play with a player, I guess, similar genre of Kelly. And unfortunately what happens is, you know, you're at a certain level, you miss one thing in a show and all of a sudden, Oh, he's lost it, man. He, you know, he's, and it's, it's really unfortunate because people don't sit back and go like, wow, this guy's really bringing some stuff here. They look, you know, they're looking, they're looking for him to mess up. And when it doesn't happen, they maybe make things up. And so, um, <laughs> I, I love what you do, man. And, and, you know, it's, it's really funny how, um, I realize how small our community is every time you post a video and I see somebody in it that I know. That you know, that, yeah. You know, it's, it's hilarious. <laughs> it's funny. No, thanks. Thanks very much, man. Yeah, it, it's kind of it's kind of cool. Like like uh, Steve and I were talking before the show, and I said, you know, we, we don't we've never known each other before the show. Kelly, you and I didn't know each other before uh, long ago. We started communicating on Facebook, I think, right? That, yeah. Yeah. And uh, it was just a, a gradual friendship that came about to the point where we're gonna, hopefully we're going to get you once in a while on the show as a contributor, by the way. Yeah, definitely. That would be really cool to get That'd you on cool. a, a show or two. So, Sean, there we go. We got another, up- well, it's another the, upcoming. The whole s- six degrees of Kevin Bacon here, because <laughs> when uh, when these gentlemen were on my podcast, I told Steve about um, uh, he did a drum clinic here in Dartmouth back and I think it was like 81 and it was for, uh, it was for Simmons drums. And I remember being there and, uh, and uh, when I told him about it, he, he, you know, Oh yeah. You know, it was funny. And, and so there's that thing. I mean, you know, I didn't know Steve, but I kind of met Steve in 81. I met Kelly through being on this show and he and I start to chat. And then all of a sudden it's like, Oh, well, you know, Patrick's in this video and he, this guy and that guy. So it's really interesting how we think our music community is so big, but really it's not that big. Right. When you think about it. No, right. It's well, a lot of connections. Uh, now, Kelly, you said you, you might have to scoot. What time you got to get off the air? Uh, we're we're nine prob- thirteen. Probably two minutes. I got to, right. I got to, I got to get dinner going. Steve, I, I think we should wrap this in two minutes anyway, because I want to have Steve back on the show too, because um, here's a here's a cool, interesting thing about it. Um, he was talking about this other guy, the guy that played drums for um, Super Tramp as being the most underrated drummer of all time. Yeah. Um, and and I, w- I would say that there are people who underrated you. Not to the same extent as as uh, Bob Siebenberg, but yeah, yeah, I think that's uh, that could be said too. I think you're a, you're a gifted dude. I think we should we should like end the show right about here because I want to have you back on the show and talk about that more about your gift of of you know because you you have a gift with rhythms as well as you know you're not just a drummer you're a percussionist. I, I just like to make music. That's really uh, whether I'm playing because I play guitar, I play keyboards. <clears throat> it's all and it, it all is part of just making music. So right. Uh, so you so you could have done. You're telling me you probably could have done the Dave Grohl thing and wrote your own album and then just put together a touring band. Maybe <laughs> I, never, I never really considered it. Because uh, I had <laughs> it's an interesting it's an well, it's an interesting I thing. I swear to God, if I was ever on a show that Dirty Girl's name came up, I'd be done. But uh, anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll listen to Steve's answer. No, but I'm just saying you're talking about a guy who actually wrote his first album by himself, basically. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think I'd want to do that. I mean, Kelly and Mike bring so much to the table, you know that uh, it's a collaboration and. I, I like it that way. I don't like to work just by myself. Right. 
it's, you know, I, I, I like the fact that you're, you know, you, you see the value that other people can add to what you're already putting out there. I, I certainly do. The part of the, the reason we changed uh, some of the personnel from the last album is I didn't feel that, that the guys we were working with had the same uh, desire to create. Right. Uh, the last album, we basically, a lot of the stuff was spoon fed. Uh, so uh, I wanted, I, I, I need the co collaboration. I need to work with people. Music is, is, uh, it's a team sport, you yep. know? And uh, I, I don't think I would be happy just doing everything myself. And can I just say one thing, Ken? Yeah, sure. I don't think there's any anybody that's ever played drums that would say Steve Nagus is underrated. Um, when Steve, when he was on my show, he actually cleared up a couple of things for me because I gave my whole, you know, I feel like I owe you some royalty money from <laughs> learning certain things back in the day. <laughs> Kelly sent me the album, and all of a sudden I'm like, man, this man's reinvented his playing. Um, because, uh, you know, Steve, you're always great, but you're playing on that album. It's just like, you know, wow. It was, you know, everything that you said about not wanting to record to you were 100% ready. Totally, totally shines through. I mean, your, your playing is just so different and so cool and groovy in some parts, precise in others. And it's, uh, it's very cool. All, all I'm saying is Sean, when I, when I said that comment too, was, and it meant no disrespect to that was, was really just that, you know, the whole thing is, is that some people out there might underrate you because they don't know you and don't really understand, you know, what goes through your thought process in terms of creating music, how you approach creating music. Yeah. And, and that, oh, since I left Saga, that has definitely uh, changed considerably. Uh, I'm way more interested in, in exploring something new than maybe I was. No, I can't even say that because I was then. But it's it's a different. It's a, I guess it's a different level now. A different level. You're, you're not the first guy that 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 has left. You know, um, other you know other bands to uh, to go and do something solo, uh, where all of a sudden they're going. You know what? Now I've got this freedom to create and go and take music in the direction I've always wanted to take it. Right. Yeah, it's uh, that's the thing that, that it's forward thinking, right? I, a lot of uh, even the Saga Boys, I say to some extent, are uh, resting on their laurels. Yeah, and, you know they're still playing the stuff I did back with them in '77. Right, uh, which is okay. I mean, it was good at the time. For me, it wasn't enough to just keep doing that. Right. You know, I I need the challenge of something new. I need to push that envelope. And uh, I just, I, that's why I had to leave. I had to basically, I had to go do something new. And I, I don't think the band has sort of kept up with that, that kind of inspired thinking to, to want to create something that right. has already been created, you know? Yeah. And you're not, you're not the first person that, um, that I've, I've talked to, um, you know, either on this show or, uh, otherwise that's gone through that whole experience uh, where they've left a major, you know, they were in a major band and left that band and then, you know, felt better about being able to be creative in their own direction, pushing music in a different direction for them. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. I like it's, cool, it's cool. You found Kelly. Oh, but I was going to say, poor Kelly, who's going to eat his own arm here in a second yeah. if he isn't able to go and. Uh... Well, yeah. <laughs> okay. I neither, and I'm wasting away to nothing. You can so tell. I, yeah. Part like, yeah, yeah. So we'd like to have Steve back here on the show, and and uh, and definitely we want to have Kelly back as a contributor because I've got, I think we've got some great questions to talk to Kelly about in terms of his approach to guitar playing and and writing because you're also involved in other projects as well. So, well, I, I yeah. taught him everything he knows. So, <laughs> <laughs> oh, the yes, there yes, there it is, there it is. Well, that's, it is. that's great that you guys have been able to develop this friendship as well through this whole process. I think that goes a long way um, to cementing that that oh, re definitely. that relationship. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. 
Two guys from two guys from no musical background whatsoever are totally musical. So um, there you go. It's not about not always about nurture. No, no, no. Not in this case, no, not always. All right. Well, listen, guys. Thanks so much for coming on the show tonight. Um, I am Kenny. You people are not. That is down below me. That's Kelly. Yeah, and over that's next to Sean or down below Sean, that's Steve. And we got Sean there. That's right. Point your finger at the other guy. All right. For me, Kenny, thank you for joining us tonight. Smiley faces, everybody, for 10 seconds.